Great, thank you, dear. Um, can everyone hear me? Always the great, great, fantastic. So um, yes, as Dia had said, we are going to be looking today at Care Inspectorate Wales. Um, so the basics of inspection, how to meet expectations, and then how to exceed expectations as well. And then at the end of the presentation, the lovely Syl will be talking a little bit about how Birdie can help you meet those expectations. So without further ado, uh, how, do this, how do I get this to work? Here we go, fantastic. So my name is Lucy, just so you know who is talking to you today. I am responsible for all of Birdie's CQC, Care Inspectorate Scotland and Care Inspectorate Wales content. So I've been working alongside expert partners, um, industry bodies and regulatory bodies to bring all of this content together. So hopefully today, we'll be able to share information that's come straight from Care Inspectorate Wales, um, from those experts and from events just like this to help you understand a little bit more about um, the inspections, about what to expect at inspection and then how to succeed at them. So the first part of this is going to go right back to basics and discuss what the Care Inspectorate Wales is. So for those of you who are kind of maybe new to, um, oh, and this is important to say as well, that Birdie work primarily with domiciliary care um, partners, as well as some live-in and complex care partners. So a lot of this presentation will be within that framing. So if you are a residential um, care partner or you work in any other form of care, there will still be a lot in, the, in here, hopefully for you to take away and feel like you've learned something. But if you are domiciliary care, uh, this is especially tailored towards you. Back to the slide. What are Care Inspector at Wales? So they are the national regulator for Wales. They register care providers. They monitor, inspect and rate services. They take action to protect people who use services and they speak out on some key social care issues. So anything social care, Care Inspector at Wales will be involved and they will be regulating your business. So they're a good, good person to know. Well organization to know. Why do they regulate home care? So there can be sometimes resentment around regulators, uh, especially because they seem to come in, wander around your business, throw things about and then go, you've not passed, congratulations. However, there is a reason why they're regulating home care. It's to create a basic standard of care delivery for everyone. So that doesn't just mean for the person that for the people that you're caring for, but for your loved ones, for yourself, eventually. It's good to know that there is a body that is making sure there is a basic standard of care delivery that must be met in order for care to be provided. They're also there to provide accountability for care providers who may be failing some recipients. So this is where they have the ability to mark you as not having passed and then the ability to, if it's not gone well, close down the business. That sounds like a lot, but actually, if you think about the bigger picture of people being protected, feeling confident about the care they can get, and Wales becoming known as one of the greatest sort of providers of social care, it's overall a great outcome. They also help care recipients and family members make more informed decisions about who provides their care. So obviously, as you know, they, they provide all of their findings on their website. It's very easy to find out who is a um, high performing care provider and who's less high performing and for me personally and for any of my loved ones I know I would want to make sure that the people who are looking after them were the highest performing possible so that's why they do it um, and they're on our side and I know that seems <laughs> that can seem sometimes not the case but truly it's to create a better standard of care for, for everyone so Care Inspectorate Wales in regulate home care um, against a set of national standards that I'm sure all of you who've been in social care or even healthcare in Wales are very familiar with at this point. So this is quality of life they'll assess you against. So whether you promote the well-being rights and choices of those receiving care, staffing, so whether there are enough skilled and qualified staff members, health and well-being. So do you support the physical and mental health of individuals and promote their overall well-being? Safeguarding. So do you have robust procedures and processes in place to make sure that individuals do not suffer from abuse or harm or neglect? Leadership and management. This is often one of the ones which comes up as uh, 
most tricky to meet for a lot of people. So we will be covering that in the presentation. But it's assessing how you're governed, assessing your management and assessing your leadership team within the service, including the ability to continuously improve on what you're doing. Care and support seems like a pretty <laughs> obvious one for, for all of us in social care, but measuring the appropriateness and effectiveness of the care and support provided. And then environment. So for domiciliary care, this includes sort of making sure that the people that you are caring for, that their homes are adequately um, that their homes adequately set up for their needs, that they have the equipment that they need, and that they have things like appropriate ventilation or appropriate cooling or heating equipment as well. So these are the national standards, but specifically for domiciliary care providers, they actually have a sheet which helps break this down even further, just into four key areas. So this is the first way to kind of help simplify um, when you're looking to meet expectation standards, is to break it into these four key areas. So well-being is the one that they pull out, care and support is what they pull out, leadership and management and environment. So although we have all of these national standards here, we can break them down into these four. So we're gonna be looking today at sort of like ways you can meet these four standards um, by sort of putting in simple procedures and processes in place. I'm just gonna cover lightly what happens during an inspection. So, Oh, where am I? Here we go. Um, so during the kind of like inspection process themselves, for those of you who've already gone through an inspection or have had one recently, you're probably very, very familiar with this. If you're awaiting your first inspection, this is just some brief things about what will happen and sort of how the whole process works. So you're typically notified about 10 working days in advance. Um, the inspectorate does aim to inspect every 18 months. So if you haven't had an inspection yet, you are likely to. Um, and if it has been about 18 months, it's coming. So the way in which you kind of prepare for the inspection is that they will notify you. You then get to um, do a self-assessment ahead of the inspection coming. So what I am gonna put in the chat here, if I can, a really useful PDF. Um, we'll share various materials with you afterwards, but let's see if I can do that. So this is a link <laughs> to a PDF. I hope that works. If not, I'll send it out again at the end. Um, so this is an amazing PDF that includes sort of a really good way to self-assess your business against those four areas that I showed earlier. So um, it shows you what good looks like and then what not good looks like. So I would utilize this when it comes to sort of preparing for your inspection. So based on that, you're then able to gather information ahead of the inspection, such as your care plans, risk ass assessments, any training records, staff records, anything you need uh, to demonstrate compliance and then provide evidence during that inspection. Inspection day then comes. Um, so here we can see sort of the inspector will arrive, they'll introduce themselves. They will generally always explain the process and the purpose of the, of the inspection, just to kind of make sure everyone is aligned with what's about to happen. Then they're going to review your documentation. So this is where having all of your evidence ready, easily searchable and, and um, good to go and up to date is very, very important. They're gonna look through your policies, your procedures, your records, including those care plans that I mentioned, including any risk assessments and including any staff qualifications as well. They will then conduct interviews. So they may conduct interviews with staff members, with service users, and also sometimes their families to make sure that they've got enough information to appropriately assess how you're doing. So um, one key thing to remember is it's always good to make sure everyone is prepared. Um, we had a provider in one of these uh, sessions, we do live in-person workshops around the country, so keep an eye out for them. But in one of those workshops, she said that the worst mistake she ever made before inspection was being the only person that could answer things. So this is one key point is that make sure you are not the only person in your business that can find the documentation and can answer key questions. Uh, we actually have some worksheets available that will be coming out soon that will help you prepare for um, any team questions that may come up, which hopefully will be useful as well as gather any evidence for the inspection. So um, we'll keep an eye out for those as well. 
So once they've done those interviews, they'll be doing observations. So the inspector will observe, they will um, often go on visits, they'll look at interactions between staff and service users, and they'll also look at interactions between leadership and staff as well. So um, that's where it's very good to make sure that you have that open communication um, and that people are prepared for the inspection. After that, they will be assessing everything they've seen against those national standards that we saw. So these are the kind of regulatory requirements that are set by Care Inspectorate Wales, and this is exactly what they will be um, assessing you against. Then they will have a feedback and discussion session. So this is where you, they, you will actually get a chance to speak to the inspector and they will give you feedback straight off the bat on that day at the inspection. Um, so this is where they can look at areas of good practice, places that you've done really well, and highlight some areas that may require some improvement. Based on this, they'll then produce a first inspection report. So this will just outline the findings of the inspection as they saw it, including those areas we've done really well and including those areas where there may be room for improvement. So what happens after an inspection? And again, for all of you who are probably, this has just happened to you, you're like, yes, yes, we know. Don't worry, we're getting to the really good stuff. <laughs> but this is to make sure that if anyone's got an inspection coming up, that they feel prepared for what the whole process is going to look like. So the inspector produces an inspection report, summarizing all the findings and outcomes of the inspection. This is a draft report. So they actually share a draft version of this report back to you for your review and your feedback. This is a really good opportunity to then respond to the draft report and address any inaccuracies or provide any additional information that you feel may sway something one way or the other. Once you've done that, that was your chance, the final report comes out. So this will take into account your response, um, but it will ultimately be the final decision of Care Inspectorate Wales as to where, whether you fall on past or not past. Um, where Wales is actually different, and I really like this, uh, in, different to, the, to England and to Scotland, is that in England and Scotland, there's a ratings point system where it goes all the way from sort of requires improvement to outstanding or excellent. There is a sort of secret rating system within Wales where some providers are made aware of where they stand on that scale, but publicly you either pass or you don't pass. And personally, I think that is great because it creates a better standard of care overall. Um, so you will kind of, with that report, when it gets shared, that final report, you will either get a improvement notice if you haven't passed, or if you passed, you will also get some points to improve on, but congratulations, you've done it. So you will get a um, report that is sent to you and that will also be published publicly on Care Inspector of Wales. So they may conduct a follow-up inspection in some cases if some specific things have been highlighted as well as provide an improvement plan to help you improve on those. Um, and then generally there will be continuous monitoring um, throughout to make sure that you're still complying with those standards. So that is the general inspection journey. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> so for any of you who've recently gone through it, Congratulations, I'm sure you've absolutely nailed it. Um, but for anyone about to go through it, what I'm about to show you now are some things that have come up in previous workshops from speaking to experts and from speaking to regulatory bodies around how to get the essentials of inspection right. So it feels like when you're looking at the standards and when you're looking at those worksheets, there is a lot to cover. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the key important things and how to meet expectations at inspection so that when the day comes you're not stressed you're looking forward to it because you're able to meet it very very easily so we're going to look at safety and we're going to look at leadership in the context of meeting basic expectations so by prioritizing safety within your business and that is a wide umbrella but it is possible to hone in on it you will support the quality of life, staffing, health, well-being, safeguarding, protection and care and support national standards. In particular, you will completely cover off the care and support national standards. So how do you prioritise safety? It's not as simple as just saying, well, prioritise safety. Here we've got some tangible ways that you can ensure and demonstrate safety within your organisation. So all of these have been taken from a checklist that has been created um, using resources from Care Inspectorate Wales, as well as resources from different, um, different events and, and people that we've spoken to. Uh, this is just a sample of some of the things you need to make sure your business has to ensure that you are safe. 
So anti-abuse policy, safe working practices policy, medication dispensing, health and safety, proof of safeguarding training, proof of personal safety plans, and clear care visit schedule. So you'll find these and all so much more on the um, checklists that will be made available to you shortly. Um, however, it's not just enough to have all of these things that ensure safety within your business. A lot of businesses start off with a best intentions anti-abuse policy or safe working practices policy. How do you make sure that when the inspectorate looks at them, they can actually see that you are using them and they can see that it's a culture threaded without the business to prioritise safety? We're going to look at this as an example. So we're just going to take the complaints procedure as an example, but you can apply this to any of your policies and procedures across the business to make sure that people are actually aware of them and are using them. So have a copy of the procedure clearly available in any office hub that you may have. Include a copy of the policy or procedure in any new team member welcome and onboarding pack. Include a copy in a new client welcome and onboarding pack if it's relevant to them. Have a log of any concerns raised related to the policy organised by the topic and how they've been dealt with. So we'll come on to this um, in a second, but evidence. Evidence is key for everything. If something is sitting in a dusty filing cabinet, it's not good. It's not going to be counted really by, um, by the inspectors as anything that's valid for your business. It needs to be seen to be alive. It needs to be seen to be active and it needs to be seen to be known and used by those without your business. And then finally, have a log of internal team feedback for the leadership team, complete with any actions and improvements related to the policy. So this is how you kind of take what is a static document and keep it alive and keep it moving throughout your organization. And the inspector will be very impressed if you're able to do that and demonstrate that with all of your kind of safety policies. We're going to look quickly at leadership. So I will be moving quite quickly through this presentation so we can make sure that we kind of cover quite a lot of ground. But as Dia said, we'll be sending it out afterwards as long as all of our other materials to do with this. Um, and we might have some time for some questions at the end as well. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at leadership now. So prioritizing leadership um, supports all of these um, areas, but also specifically covers, interestingly enough, leadership and management for domiciliary care providers. So here are some tangible ways uh, in the same way that we've just seen with safety um, that you can demonstrate a well-led organization. So a clear statement of values and purpose for the business. A lot of businesses, um, smaller businesses, when they start up, don't see this as important. However, if you don't know where you're going and you don't know why you're doing something, you can't expect the people to work for you to also really know why they're doing it. It takes a whole team to really deliver um, the best care possible. And if you have one clear goal, one clear common direction and one value that you all believe in, you can guarantee that that care will be of a better standard than if people are just doing it for the hell of it. So always have a clear statement of why you're doing what you're doing. And that is also a great way to um, measure anyone that you may be hiring into the business to see how much they align with those statements that are important to you. Staff handbook. So this should include any training resources, all of the appropriate company contact details, up-to-date guidance on any company software, as well as all those policies that I mentioned. Essentially just a little handbook for anyone joining the business so they can look at it and see what they need to know immediately. Proof of regular audits. So this kind of shows that you are on top of different facets of the business. So this is definitely for anyone in the leadership team and anyone in management capacity. You must be able to share, show that you aren't just letting stuff ride or pushing stuff off. If you have proof that you are regularly auditing, that you're aware of different areas of the business and that you can speak to them and you can show the improvements that have been made, that is huge for any inspector. It will show that you have a concrete hold over the business. Proof of availability. So it is very, very difficult when you're incredibly busy to um, sort of stay in touch or to communicate. However, if the leadership team is shown that they are available for, um, for the team to be able to reach them, respond immediately to problems, to pick stuff up, to um, take feedback, share feedback, that again is really, really good. And some ways you can do that is through WhatsApp messages or regular log or phone calls or through email chains or through demonstration of a concrete calendar where people are um, have regular one-to-ones. There's lots of ways to show that you're in communication, in contact with people in the organization. 
Finally, onboarding. So this kind of speaks to the values and purpose that you discussed at the start of this. So you need to have a clear onboarding process for anyone joining your business beyond just, I don't know, I guess you're going to shadow this person for a while. There is a proven um, increase of retention rate by a substantial amount if someone starts off well in their first month. And that means knowing what they're going to be doing on the first day, in the first week, in the first two weeks, in the first three weeks, and so on. So um, there are lots of templates for onboarding processes online. Uh, Skills for Care is actually one which we recommend. They have some great resources around that to make sure that anyone joining your business is gets it's off to a great start um, and you have a great team member who sort of is helps you to grow the whole operation. So say that you have noticed, just have a quick drink of water. <laughs> Ooh, I don't usually talk this long, we can do this. Say that you have noticed that the leadership processes are not satisfactory. Say that you kind of have a feeling that it's something that has come up before, that people are unhappy, that people are starting to talk about how things aren't working. Here's a quick guide of how to fix and uh, how to recognize and then fix some of those unsatisfactory processes. So first thing is evaluation. So look at all the different areas of a business where there could potentially be a problem. Is it communication? Is it that training isn't good enough? Is it that staff retention is bad? It could be that you're getting a lot of complaints recently. The first thing you need to do is recognize and own up to something that isn't working. There's a thing called a sunk cost fallacy, which is where you kind of go, well, it's already bad, so we're just gonna keep going. We're just gonna keep going. We've already done it like this for ages. No, there's no time like the present to actually look at it, recognize something needs to change and fix it. One key way to establish what needs to change is to seek feedback. So you need to create an environment where people feel able to go, this isn't working. Um, and from that, you'll be able to then um, see whether other people think that, be able to build up some solutions to it. Um, a key way to do this is to invest in staff training and development. So um, by helping people feel supported about your organization, this is a great way to um, encourage people to feel invested to create change within it. So if you provide training, if you provide development, you're going to get people that help you to spot these areas in your business and help you to fix them and help you to grow. Um, open, open communication, already covered that. Clear expectations. So this is something which, again, when you're lost in the delivery of care, it can be very hard to kind of keep a high vision of what's happening. So have clear expectations for staff performance. So one thing that when I first joined Verdi, my manager uh, sat me down and said, here are my expectations of you. And it was around sort of, you know, deliver stuff on time. If you have a problem, speak up. And then she asked me, what are your expectations of me as your manager? And that was a really great way to kind of make sure that we were both on the same page. So if you are managing anyone right now, it's OK. Stop, sit down and go, here are my expectations and what are your expectations? It's a great way to open up a clear dialogue. And then finally, prioritize quality. Prioritize quality. So if you are an upholder of quality, everyone else in the business will be as well. And then monitor, evaluate and continuously learn from your business. All of these things will put you in an excellent position to be a strong, well-led business. And an inspector will recognize that. And so will your care recipients. And so will their family members. And so will everyone who comes into contact with your business. So the final part of meeting basic expectations, we've looked at safety, we've looked at leadership. None of this is anything if you do not evidence it. So evidence is everything so when we were talking about how the inspector will be looking at all your documentation or your policies procedures they'll be looking at um everything that your business has done it doesn't mean just having a static document somewhere it means having records that are always up to date having training up to date care plans up to date um risk assessments up to date and not just having that but a way to find that information specific information and be able to share that very quickly so one way in which that's much easier to do is obviously if you have a software system. So um, more and more care businesses are using software to help them manage that. We would obviously 100% um, <laughs> recommend that you do that um, simply because it will save you time, it will save you stress, and it will also help you to grow your business um, and improve much, much faster. So this is the basics. I'm sure all of you have already kind of covered a lot of this and uh, 
are doing really, really well. So we're going to look at those who kind of want to go that next step, who've kind of passed the, the inspection and want to then become a sort of bit renowned within the country for being the very, very best, the very best. So here again, we're going to look at two things. So, well, we're going to look at three things. So the first of them is personalised care. So um, person-centred care is something which comes up a lot. Um, and often the two things are, seem to be interchangeable, person-centred care and personalised care. However, they are not. So person-centred care is much more of a general philosophy. So it is the idea of sort of if you prioritise everything um, to do with the person and take it into account when it comes to delivering their care, that you'll get much better outcomes. That is true. However, personalised care is the actual tangible things that you do to achieve that philosophy of person-centred care. So one way that I like to think of it is sort of person-centred care, the overall philosophy, and that is the thing which everyone should be aiming for. Personalised care, that's the difference. That is the actual things that you do to get there. So how do you achieve personalised care? How do you make sure you differentiate between general person-centred care and personalised care? Here again are some examples uh, of ways in which you kind of go above and beyond, and you can apply this to pretty much every practice within your business. So a medication management plan. So it's not just a, this person takes this medication at this time. It goes beyond that. It looks at their medical history, any allergies they could have, um, any potential interactions with other medications, and any preferences they may have when it comes to taking medication. There was a, a lady that was being looked after by one of our care partners who was absolutely terrified of needles. And every time someone tried to inject her, she absolutely lost her mind. So they figured out a way to provide the medication in tablet form. It was a little bit difficult to do, but they got the support of their family members and they figured out a way to do that. That is personalised care. That isn't just going, oh, Jeannie will be fine. She'll be all right. Um, social engagement, similar thing here. It's not about sort of, um, you know, where well, we put the telly on, that's a task, we do that. It's about looking what the person um, really enjoys doing and creating a series of tasks that are kind of focused around that. So again, we have a really amazing story of one of our care partners. We're looking after a elderly gentleman who used to be a marathon runner. And all he wanted to do was do one more marathon, <laughs> just one more marathon. The guy was 92. He wasn't going to be doing a, a marathon, but they put in place a plan to be able to get him to a point where he was able to sit in a wheelchair long enough to do the Brighton Marathon. So that meant making sure that his bed sores were, were kind of taken care of, that he didn't have any skin conditions, that family members were aware. They would take him out for longer and longer roles in the wheelchair to make sure he was comfortable with it, that his fluids were fine, that they had enough sort of um, medical equipment around to be able to take care of any emergency. And so all these little individual things then built up to this guy having this amazing day and having this amazing memory. That's what personalised care again looks like. And then end of life care, just another example, it's not a case of sort of crucified or leave it with the family, not crucified, goodness no, uh, I don't think anyone would want that for themselves. Um, but uh, the one the one with the buried, let's just stick with that one, you know what I mean, buried or, or whatever, then um, it's a case of going one step further, what songs do they want there, what, um, what readings do they want there, what family members do they want there, it's a case of really knowing sort of what someone would want and what how they want to be represented on that final day. So this is personalised care. It's not just the basic, it's going one step beyond. So, oh, that's the last on that one. So yes, again, we've got a, a upcoming handbook, which will have some, some useful information for this. Second thing of three, outcomes-led care. So this, again, is kind of where our partners that we've seen that have gone above and beyond, that have done really well, they have this huge focus on outcomes-led care. So again, it's a little bit of a buzzword. People are kind of like aware of outcomes-led care. Yes, it's about outcomes. What does that actually mean and how do you actually get there? So it's really, really easy to kind of get lost in sort of task based care. So, you know, you turn up, you deliver, you do this, you do that, you do that and then you leave. However, it is so, so important to make sure that 
all of your team have an outcomes-based headspace when it comes to delivering care. So um, the reason why it's really important is if you can imagine you're going in day after day and caring for this person and you are helping them sort of, you know, move from their bed to the chair, watch TV, give them their breakfast, and then you head off and then you come back and help them move from the chair back to the bed. You kind of, if they don't make it to the chair one day, you sort, yeah, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. They, they didn't manage to get up on their own today. That, that's all right. Um, and you start to let things slip being like, you know, oh, they didn't do it, but that's fine. However, if you knew that the outcome of that person, the reason why they wanted to be able to get out of bed was because they had their grandchildren coming to visit and they wanted to be able to get out of bed themselves to help be up before their grandchildren arrived, you'd be more inclined to make sure the task gets done. You'd be more inclined to make sure that you were working with that person to help them regain some of their mobility to get out of bed by themselves because you knew why it was important to them and you had, any, you had an outcome in mind with each task that you were doing. So with that in mind, this is a way to help develop that outcomes-based idea for tasks. So a thorough assessment, everything begins with a thorough assessment. So involve your family, um, involve, not your family, I mean, unless they're you know, related to the person you're caring for, involve their family, involve their advocates, involve them as much in the decision-making. And then you develop a care plan for their initial needs. I'm sure everyone that you're caring for already has this this care plan this sort of like you know this is what they need medication all that sort of thing so you need to have that before you start so that's good then you set clear goals so based on that initial conversation that you had you'd send then set goals about what's important to them where do you want them to get what will help them regain mobility what will help them keep their brain sharp what will help them you know be able to take their medication independently um, so yeah involve them in the decision making to, to, to make those goals concrete and then monitor and evaluate progress. So by creating little tasks that build up to that big goal, you're then able to see which of those tasks didn't get completed and therefore where you stand on achieving that longer term goal. Um, use feedback to inform improvements. So obviously, if something isn't working, again, sunk cost fallacy, don't just keep trying it. Make an adjustment to the little tasks. Um, and eventually you'll be able to find out a rhythm that will help you get to that end outcome. You can also adjust the end outcome as well. If you have the full support of the family and the full support of the person, then it's OK. Things can be flexible, but things must always have an outcome at the end of them. And then, yes, training and supporting staff. So provide ongoing training, supervision, keep reminding people of why the outcomes are important. Um, keep helping people to buy into sort of that idea of outcomes led care and provide people with the support they need to deliver the best care they can. Um, this is a great way of fostering a above and beyond organization. So I'm entering to the last kind of part of this, which is about connecting with others. So all of you on this call, you're already doing that. That's great. You're already going out of your way. And thank you, by the way, because it's not easy to get time off when you work in social care. So we all really appreciate it um, and hope that you are getting useful things out of this presentation. So connecting with others is invaluable. There are conferences and events everywhere around you know, the whole of the UK and specifically in Wales. Um, do you make sure you go to them to connect with people? Because some of the questions that you have, people have some of the answers for them and vice versa. So always make sure to get out there as much as possible. Um, participate in online groups, collaborate with other people and engage with local authorities. These are all really good ways to this is, there's this thing in social care where sometimes people feel like they shouldn't focus on their own professional development or connections with other people. And that's so wrong <laughs> because this is such an important industry and you're doing such amazing things for people that you should be focusing on your own development. You should be focusing on connecting with others. You, you will be much stronger if you do that and then therefore everyone will be much stronger so please please make sure that you connect with other people ask questions um, and get involved in the community and then finally here we've just got some free online resources that are available as well so uh, it's not always easy to get out to these events and, and to you know take the time away from work so all of these places have some amazing resources available to to help when it comes to not just inspections but the day to day running of a care business because it is it's difficult so um yeah it's uh it's good to to always keep uh, finding more information and i think 
That's me. So um, I am going to hand over to Syl. Uh, yes, thank you all so much for your time. And uh, Syl, whenever you're ready, take it away. Thanks, Lucy. And yeah, super insightful. And yeah, just on the last point there around what you say about, you know, when you invest in yourself, that then helps you be stronger for other people. I think it's it's, it's so important um, to do that in, in social care and when people are always working for other people and, and sometimes not investing in themselves, that then does not have the, the right long term outcome for anyone. So, so yeah, I really agree with that. Um, I'm Syl. I work as an enterprise partnership manager here at Birdie. Um, so that means that I work with some of the UK and, and Wales's largest and most successful care organisations um, to evaluate whether BED is the right partner for, for them and their business, um, both with respect to care and, and, and business um, as well. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Lucy, thank you. Um, so I'll just give you guys a quick overview now of you know, who we are at BED and what we, what we do, and then I'll talk specifically around some of the things that we have in our toolkit to help with um, Care Inspectorate Wales uh, success. So Birdie is a simple mobile and desktop uh, solution for managing and delivering outstanding home care. So it's a single platform solution for care management, rostering and finance. Um, everything that we do at Birdie, everything that we build, every feature, every update that we make is built in partnership with our amazing care partners and we get feedback continuously from the people that are using Birdie and from the people that are in the process of evaluating Birdie as well. Um, and we take on feedback then from providers in England, Scotland and Wales um, to ensure that we can help um, not just meet, but really uh, exceed standards in, in all of those um, regions. Um, and in addition to the software that we obviously provide as well, we also um, offer practical resources and support for the care industry, such as this, this webinar here and all the other events that DR is organizing and all the other fantastic uh, resources that Lucy and the team are putting out there as well because we really do believe that it's so important for us all to continuously learn continuously invest in ourselves and that then helps us all deliver better care for those people that um, access your services um your next slide so just to kind of touch on some of the areas that Lucy mentioned specifically and how Birdie can help with those so it starts with assessing so when you assess a person you can really do that with Brody to ensure that you're achieving a personalized care plan for them. Um, so with Brody, you get access to a number of digital assessments that cover a range of different activities of daily living and, and risk assessments, etc. Um, and Birdie enables you to really tailor that assessment process to the individual in front of you so that you can reduce the risk of you know, over assessing them or under assessing them you know, depriving them of, of, of liberty or also or, or equally, um, you know, not uh, meeting all of their needs. And within that care um, assessment framework, you can also really easily record um, personal preferences, needs, wishes, et cetera, et cetera, that help you then tailor everything to that individual um, to make sure that that care is really personalized. Um, next, we have... Um, on that same topic of personalization, um, things do change quickly in care and you might have one individual that has, you know, one thing going on with them and, and you know, you're, you're on track and it's going well and then something changes and then you need to, to, to update the care plan in response to that. Um, so there is, you know, that can happen both because you've identified or someone in your team has identified a change in that person's need and you need to respond to it. But it can also be something that happens gradually over time and as such, it's also important to do those regular reviews as well to make sure that, you know, something that happens gradually is being picked up on. So we have with Birdie, we have Bird Analytics, which is our reporting uh, suite, which gives you a really good way of sense checking that you've done that, you know, your, none of your assessments are, you know, outdated by whatever met metric that is, you know, whether that is 60 days, 90 days, six months, you know, however often you need to review those, which could be different again for for different clients with different needs to help you sense check that you know that is all up to date um that obviously ensures personalization is maintained and it also helps you demonstrate that you're a well-led um organization as as well um and then if we can move to the next slide um outcomes is so important and it's so much more than just the buzzword 
uh, to have that ready. And we're really keen to ensure that you have the right tools to set meaningful outcomes for the people you support, um, document those outcomes, and then also track the progress um, against those outcomes. So we have a module in, in Brody, which is, is currently in beta, but it is available uh, for partners. So if you don't have access to it and you are using Brody, let, let us know. Um, you can set an outcome for, for the people that you look after, why that's important to them, you know, when they'd like to achieve it by, et cetera, et cetera. And then on an ongoing basis, you can update the progress so that you can see whether they are um, kind of stagnating, not really, you know, not really progressing, not really regressing kind of status quo, whether they are actually progressing towards that outcome or whether actually they are moving backwards and regressing. And, you know, maybe that needs then has an impact on, you know, the, the daily support plan. Does it need to be adjusted? Can they actually go for, uh, you know, an even more ambitious outcome? Would they like to do that? Or actually, do we need to reevaluate whether the outcome is realistic? And maybe we need to, to readjust that as well. Um, and obviously, I think a lot of care providers already do this in kind of a more informal way in some cases, or they have it um, in a process, but it's not necessarily documented in this way that allows you to easily see that progress. And this tool is really built to help you visualize that and be able to share that as well with an inspector from, from Care Inspector at Wells to help, you know, prove that you really are going above and beyond um, in this kind of way. Um, next, we have safety. So safety first is always, um, you know, the, the, the um, mantra for almost all care providers that we speak with across all different regions. Um, and one of the areas where care providers often do struggle to manage um, to manage the provision safely is around PRM medication and managing PRM protocols for when medication should be administered. So it's, you know, it's more straightforward when you have this medication needs to be taken every morning before breakfast, as soon as you wake up, that's quite sort of easy to, to, to do relative to this medication needs to be taken when this happens, but not when that happens and only this often. And, you know, PRN is, is a bit of a minefield and it's where a lot of providers um, in different regions really do struggle to, to ensure that that is being done safely. So when you um, use Birdie's EMAR, you have the ability to select different kinds of, you know, medication, whether it's in a, you know, original packaging scheduled medication or a PRN. And if you choose PRN, you'll instantly be taken to a PRN protocol, which you can then complete to ensure that all of the information from the, from the you know, prescribing GP um, is then passed on to the care team that is administering that medication out with the clients on a daily basis or however often it's required. And this really helps you uh, reduce the risk of any um, errors or, or kind of issues around safety in, in this regard. And then um, around uh, safety as well, sometimes things do go wrong or care workers will observe something out in the community with your clients that they are concerned about. It's so important that there is that open communication where they can, you know, flag when there is something they're worried about. And we also have a system in the Birdie app where they can raise a concern or an incident or an accident or whatever it is um, directly in the app. And you can then get alerted to say, oh, you know, this has happened or that has happened. And you can then respond accordingly. Um, responding to those actions on a day to day basis is obviously very, very important. But it's also important to see over time and to understand, you know, when I get an alert, when when an alert comes through because someone hasn't had their medication or because a care worker isn't arriving when they should or, you know, whatever it might be, how, how does my team in the office actually respond to that? Are they responsive or is the alert just sitting there for hours and hours and hours without anyone picking up the phone or, or, or doing anything? So we also have, in addition to kind of helping you manage the day to day, it's also a tool to help you understand over time, how can you improve to ensure that you are safe and that you are you know demonstrating a high standard of leadership as well in terms of always looking at where you can improve to be more responsive and safer for the people that you support um in addition to that you're going to take actions on the back of some of those alerts and you know various interactions that you have are going to require you or your team to take follow-up actions to ensure that you get back on the right track or ensure that you are continuously improving and as Lucy said earlier, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So oftentimes when, when you know, something happens in an office and you, and you find out that, okay, this happened, I need to do this. 
you know, you've been doing this for a long time, you, you know, you've got the experience to know what you need to do. What we hear often is that those steps that you then take are the right ones that you take, but it's not necessarily documented everywhere, anywhere that that's what you did and that it's that how you got back on track and that's how you ensured the safety of the people that you support. So we've built into Birdie and it, it lives across a number of areas in the product, not just alerts, but um, other areas as well, where on the back of any kind of issue or, or something that's happened, um, you can create an action on the back of that, either a one-off action or a recurring action with kind of notes to self almost to say, okay, you know, this is the second time this week that Heather has turned up, you know, more than half an hour late for, a, for her first visit. The action I'm going to take is I'm going to, you know, give her a, a, a formal warning or I'm going to do this. I'm going to send her on a course to understand the importance of compassion and why we do what we do. You know, whatever the action is, it enables you then to document that that's been, you know, escalated in that way. And then also when that has been completed, you can log that this has been done, that you can then easily have a track record of what happened and prove to any inspector or prove to yourself that, you know, we are responsive, we're dealing with this. And these are all the actions that we've taken to ensure that we're delivering a, a safe and, and a, a safe service with a, with a high quality of, of leadership uh, throughout. Um, yes, leadership. Um, we also have on that, and this is something you can use alongside alerts, you can use it alongside actions, you can use it alongside general notes or, you know, interactions with GPs, social workers, you know, anything that you kind of need to document on a day to day basis. Um, you can then record that and kind of file it away in a sort of almost digital filing cabinet so that you can really easily go back and look at how did we deal with this exactly? and build up that bank of evidence so that when the inspector comes and for your self-assessment and everything else, you've got some really great case studies to show of how you are going above and beyond. So that, for example, here you've recorded a compliment that, you know, maybe a family member or a, or a client have gotten in touch to say that they're really happy about something. You can then file that away with a tag that you are being, um, that it's an interaction with a, a family member, it's a compliment, it's, you know, you might want to add a, a caring or a well-led or a safe or, you know, whatever, um, you know, whatever kind of positive thing you feel is related to that particular um, event. And then you can build up that bank of evidence over time. And there might be an action associated with it. If it was a complaint rather than a compliment, you might want to take an action on the back of that com complaint that you, that you logged. And then you can easily kind of see that audit trail of how that has evolved over time and how that's helping you build up that bank of evidence and, and, and deliver improvements um, in your services. Um, that will then help you, as I kind of alluded to, understand how that evolves. You know, are we getting a lot of are we getting a lot of complaints about this? Are we seeing a lot of issues with that? So I don't know if you can see the example on this on the screen there, but that's a complaint someone's raised where a care worker is, is keeps forgetting to take out the bins. And obviously the client's not very happy or family's not very happy. Um, and this complaint has been raised, you know, more than more than one. So you've got that then documented in Birdie that we keep getting this complaint. And it's very easy then to say, oh, oh no, we keep getting this complaint. That's so annoying, you know, can't, can't they stop complaining? But actually what we need to think is, okay, this is a real opportunity for us to address this issue, get back on track and get better and make sure that this doesn't happen again and make sure that we take the right learning to ensure that other clients or other care workers, you know, don't have the same experience. And that's when you can then use that data to help you understand where things are going well and also where things are not going so well, so that you can really have an action plan. Um, and critically as well for the care inspectorate document where, you know, you've had taken such actions so that you can prove that you are, 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 are actually acting on the feedback that you get positive or constructive. Um, and I wonder if that was the last one. Um, overall, I think this is kind of the note to, to end on really for me is that, you know, there is so much work of a really high quality going on every single day in, in Wales and everywhere else where care providers really are doing a fantastic job. Um, and oftentimes when people um, have an inspection with, uh, inspection, inspection result that they are maybe not so happy with, 
sometimes, you know, there is general, genuine feedback that they need to take on board in areas where they do need to improve. And sometimes as well, it is just the case that they maybe haven't documented everything that they do do in the right way. And if it's not documented, it didn't happen. And Birdie really is built to help you easily without it being a really time consuming job. We have to sit down and write an essay every single day about, you know, what you've done and what you haven't done to help you really easily build up that bank of evidence and then associate that back with standards that you want to adhere to around being safe, around having a, you know, a strong leadership team, et cetera, and being able to then present that to the inspector, which is going to be hopefully make the inspection a much um, more pleasant experience. Um, and also when you do that self-assessment, which I guess is the first impression really of what the inspector is, is looking for, it's going to really help you be present your business in a really strong way. But it can also help you kind of be honest about, and also these are the areas that I've identified that I want to improve my business. So I think oftentimes the inspector might be more impressed with having insights into that. We're not perfect. You know, we're always, every one of us have got areas that we can improve. Um, and to both identify what you're doing well and where you can improve is going to really help you um, put that forward and hopefully get a really good outcome with the inspector as a, as a result. Um, and then I think we have maybe one more slide about the resources that we have, or have we, maybe Lucy, you've already covered that. So I think that's it for me. Um, and I don't know if anyone has any questions, but we do have a couple of minutes left um, to, to answer those. If, if anyone has any, I see we've got um, just a couple of thanks uh, and Karen had to leave a little bit early, but I don't think we've got any questions come through yet. Um, so hopefully that means that you know we've we've answered some questions and hopefully it doesn't mean that everyone has uh just fallen asleep <laughs> from it's easy in the heat isn't it to to get a bit drowsy but hopefully we haven't uh, made that worse for you guys so it's been interesting thank you um uh martina for that um so yeah if there are no if there are no questions then i suppose we can uh, we can wrap up yeah. Um, Great. Yeah. If there are no more questions, we'll wrap up here. Just a reminder to please fill out the survey as you exit. Um, you will be receiving the slides and the recording of this. So thank you again so much for joining us today. And we, we hope to see you again someday soon. Um, take care and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks for joining us, guys. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.